You may wish to adjust the dial. You are currently tuned into the wrong station. Maybe my father was right, that I should have never left the village. But then, maybe I would have listened to him if he hadn't always been so hateful. Stop dreaming, keep your mind to your work. You cannot outrun the sentries. There is no escape. There is no escape. Not from here, not from the valley. That's what they say, isn't it? I see how you could believe it. Whatever direction you look, there's nothing out there but those distant mountains scraping the horizon, and nothing between here and there but scorched wasteland. No one has ever made it to the end of the valley. That is what they say. But of course they'd say that. Why would someone get to the end of this infernal valley only to come back and tell the tale? That's what I always thought. What you always thought. But no, this isn't a place for dreamers. It's a place for passionless dregs content to spend their whole existence hiding and sleeping the day away only to show their faces and go about their lives in the darkness of night. It's hateful. Just like that old man. Do you remember the first time I tried to leave? We were so young and foolish. I was, at least. Didn't even think to pack water with me. I thought I was clever. Getting up just before the crack of dawn, sneaking out to grab Azilda so I could hit the wastes the second the sun dipped. Azilda. I love that horse. My father did, too. And I think what happened next hurt him just as much as it did me. You never saw it, though. I guess you've heard me tell it a few times now. Sorry. I wasn't as clever as I thought, of course. Or as quiet. He heard me get up and sneak out. And while I was grabbing Azilda, he was grabbing that ancient carbine he kept on the mantle. We didn't even make it to the edge of the village before she fell over on top of me, snapping my leg like a dry twig as she died, gushing blood, one of those precious few rounds we owned lodged in her throat. It took months for my leg to set, though I don't think my heart ever mended quite right. We never spoke after that. Not about what's out here, at least. I think that was the end of the conversation to him, that even if my attitude about it couldn't be changed, his own implacable stance on the issue had been made quite clear. It was easier that way. Easier for him not to discuss it. Easier for me to silently hate him, rather than try and understand him. You know I dreamed of killing him? Putting a knife in his heart midday while he slept, taking everything I could carry and going. But I didn't. He'd done his work well and put fear in me. It's the same reason I wouldn't go with you. No matter how many times you asked. Not until he died on his own. Not until now. You know, <laughs> I may have been the one who tried to run off when we were kids, but I always thought you were the brave one. I bickered with my family, suffered their disapproval. But you, you'd fight anyone. You weren't afraid of anyone. 
them and their dogma, their resignation, their doomed village. I had my father, but you could have left any time. Nobody would have stopped you or been unhappy to see you go. Except for me. And you knew that. And you waited for me. And I was glad you did. Can you believe it was only three nights ago? It felt incredible. Not sneaking away like a rebellious child, but that it was you and me trotting slowly through the village, our things packed carefully, not rushed or haphazard, out in the open moonlight, letting them all see us leave, scowling, shaking their heads, and us knowing, knowing that we'd be leaving this place for good, that we'd escape. That first night there was no doubt in my mind. It felt like we rode for a thousand miles, for a thousand years. We talked and laughed, and both felt the thrill of wind rushing through our hair. It, uh, <laughs> it made me think back to when you taught me to ride. Properly, I mean. You hardly even knew me, but you hated the way the other children picked on me, because I'd fallen off a Zilda one too many times and was too scared to try again. But, <laughs> You wouldn't leave me be until I was on her back again, and flying down the dust plains and laughing. <sighs> laughing. Just like that first night when we left. And then we finally came to them. We passed one, two, ten of those sleeping sentries, sitting with their arms wrapped around their knees, lifeless and docile, each identical to the one near our home, though further from home than either of us had ever been. And having come that far already, they didn't seem like such a threat. Then came the first day. I'd never seen the sun before. Directly, I mean. Looked at it. I'd glimpsed it through the cracks of the window blinders back home. It's always seemed unclear to me what the rules are. But, given how orthodox my house was, not even this bit of peeking was allowed. So hot. And so bright. I'd always taken sleeping during the day for granted. How much easier it is in pitch dark under a roof. But it's clearly unnatural. No creature is meant to be sleeping when the world is filled with such overbearing light. That's where my mind wandered that morning as we rested in the shade of that stone outcropping we'd found. You were irritated with me. We'd stopped with an hour of darkness left, but I still think it was the right choice at the time. There's no knowing if we'd have found another patch of shade in that hour. And as you brooded, my mind wandered further, to the distant past, to a time when creatures were free to walk under the light of day. Seems like it's fantasy, but they say it's true. It's maybe the one thing they say that I believed. What could we have done, I wonder? What sin, what offense against the sun itself was so great that we should be punished like this? And was it our whole race? Or just those of us trapped here in the valley? Or maybe the people of the valley are our whole race? No. That, I don't believe. I'll never believe that. There must be something. Someone beyond those mountains. Someone permitted to feel the sun's warmth on their skin. Maybe I did fall asleep without realizing it. Or perhaps the baking heat sped my mind and made the hours pass. Because before long, that fiery orb rose higher in the sky and the hour approached high noon. For all our restlessness, I hadn't even taken a moment to consider the horses, how they fidgeted and shook, how they, too, seemed to desperately want to sleep. Marta controlled herself well enough. She always has. But Nathaniel was a troubled beast at the best of times. The sun was so high now, and the shade so sparse, 
It would have been difficult enough to stay out of the light had we all been lying still as death. But Nathaniel, oh, a poor stupid thing, so exhausted. When the sun was at its highest point, he began to cry and buck. And before we could calm him down, he'd already gotten up to his feet. And we looked on in horror as his ears and the top of his mane and his senseless animal eyes crested above the shade of those rocks to bask in forbidden sunlight. The rumble off in the distance came immediately. You, always the quick thinker, slapped Nathaniel hard and sent him off at a run. Who knows where he thought he was going. He was probably half blind from the light. The rumble grew louder. They really are as fast as they say. After only seconds, we could see it in the distance, approaching far too quickly. One of those stone sentries, bane of the valley, tyrant of our hopes. To think I had thought such a thing docile only half a day earlier. I'd once asked my father, when I was much younger and things hadn't been quite so bad between us, why, since horses were so much faster than men, we didn't all ride into the horizon until we reached the mountains. He laughed and told me that I had a lot to learn if I thought that nothing could be faster than a horse. The rumbling was unbearable now, as the thing emerged into clear view out of the haze of dry heat. It looked enough like a man. It was certainly carved in the image of one, though the limbs were hewn into rougher and more angular shapes than those of any living thing. But seeing one of them move for the first time, there was nothing human about it. The way it sprinted was too smooth, too consistent, never tiring or varying its stride. The unshifting stone face, carved into an expression of carefree delight, seemed as appropriate as it did unnatural. But still, despite seeing it move, despite my father's words, I wondered if it could really catch Nathaniel. He was at a full gallop. The sharp pain of the slap had sent him running, but now it was only fear and instinct. The sentry, though, as it passed our little patch of shade, and as we felt the force of the air it displaced, and the rumble of its steps in our bones, I knew. It was only a few moments later that it caught up to Nathaniel. I wasn't sure what to expect. Would it strike him down with a stone fist? Grab him and tear him apart? It was nothing even as complicated as that. It simply ran through him. Where we might have expected it to slow, it simply maintained its unnatural pace. And the instant the two made contact... Nathaniel seemed to break into a hundred pieces. It was like when we were children and we'd steal squashes from the field and hit them with sticks and see who could hit them the hardest and make the biggest mess. Except that was fun. But this... All we really saw at first was the red mist where he'd once been. It was only a few moments later that red and brown chunks of him started landing far off. And only then, after the impact, did the sentry slow, that sprint relaxing into a jog, and then a walk, and a relaxed stroll, before it stopped and sat and wrapped its arms around its knees. I wonder if you faltered in that moment, as I did, when I realized deep in my gut and soul why no living creature could live under the sun in this cursed valley. If you did, you didn't show it. You just slumped back against the rocks and told me we'd both have to ride Marta. The second night was quiet. Gone was the excitement. Despite the speed Marta carried us with, the air somehow felt more still. Even though you rarely spoke of it, even to me, I never thought it was any wonder why you'd always wanted to leave. The village was hardly a home to you in the first place. 
I don't know why the fighting started with the other village, that place where you came to us from. I was too young to understand, even if Elder Rashab had been willing to explain it. All I know is that your people burnt our crops, a step too far. So my people took things a step further still and burnt your homes. It's incredible that you even survived. You and that horse you came on were the only living things that came from that place that night. Somebody must have known what was going to happen in the morning and sent you away. They probably loved you very much. I'm sorry I never asked you about them. The second day was as quiet as the night. We didn't speak of it out loud, but with the loss of Nathaniel, we'd also lost half our supplies. We managed to save a bit of the food, but the water jugs had shattered into as many pieces as the horse. It was like torture watching the water seep into dry dirt and evaporate before our eyes, hours before we could get to it. Though to be fair, there was only so much Marty could carry. You'd gotten annoyed with me again at the end of that first day, shortly after dusk. We were picking up whatever food we could, and there were some scraps that were close to... it. And I shouldn't have felt any fear in the dark. But that face, smirking, nonchalant, arrogant. I was frozen, and by the time I realized it, you were already brushing past me to grab the food. And you turned to me and told me not to be afraid. Anyway, it was the second day. To my dismay, it seemed like there were even more sentries out here. More and more, the further we got out from the village. Who knows how long these ones had been sleeping. How long ago it had been when they killed the last of the crawling things that lived out this far. You know, I once read in one of the books at the schoolhouse about... Birds? Is that what they're called? Yes. Birds. They flew. Up in the clouds. Sounds incredible, I know. Not even they were safe from the sentries. They jump high into the air and catch them. Elder Rashab says that the sentries killed all of them too, like the lizards and the bugs. But I think... Maybe... They just left, flew away, over the mountains and off into the horizon, if only. I tried to sleep through the day, though I was hungry and thirsty. The third night was quiet again, but a more terrible quiet, grating. More of those carefree stone faces greeted us as we traveled. I started to wonder if the people that carved them had done so in their own image, if those who judged our ancestors did so with such joy. And the mountains, they still did not seem any closer. I think you sensed my fear. You turned and told me we'd make it. You didn't sound sure. They were the only words that passed between us before dawn. The outcropping we found... Well, this morning. It's small, isn't it? Though it's high noon now, and I'm still safe under its shade. So I suppose it's not that small. I slept for about an hour this morning. Though I don't know how, with all of them around us. Sitting, watching. Do you think they can even see us like this? Do they only know we exist when the light touches us? Or do they always watch, but only act when we break their sacred law? It was not a peaceful sleep. I dreamt of my father. What he told me about you, your people, when we started spending time together. Their kind is not to be trusted. This friend of yours questions the laws and the teachings. They don't share our blood, and they will lead you astray. I didn't believe it back then. But, but maybe. In my dreams, right then, I did. Only for a moment, you understand? 
I doubted you, but only in the same way I doubted my own convictions in that moment. The fear, the doubt, anger, all coming together and waking up and seeing them, the sentries, looking at me, judging me for sins I did not commit, and then turning to you and... I know now that you are only taking a small sip of water. I know that. But I was so worked up, and you have to understand what it looked like to me. Like you were gulping it down greedily. And I didn't mean to smack the skin out of your hands. But I did. Just like I'm sure you didn't mean to say the things that you said to me after I did. That you shouldn't have brought me. That you shouldn't have waited for me. Or maybe you did mean them. I would have deserved it. I had become afraid. Like the rest of them. Like my father. But even still. It hurts so much to hear it. And I'm sorry. I'm so sorry that I pushed you. I didn't think you'd go so far. And I wish you'd have just pushed me back. But you didn't. You just stood there in the sun. Looking at me. Looking at what I'd done. Watching me start to cry. And then... One of the sentries began to rise to its feet. But slowly. How odd. <laughs> Maybe it somehow knew that, with all of its brethren around us, there was no need to sprint. To chase you. It just... stood. And slowly walked toward our little patch of shade. And you just looked at me. And somehow found a smile. A smile that said goodbye without words. Before it brought a slow stone foot down on top of you. Before sitting back down with its arms crossed over its knees. At an angle just close enough that I could still see its face. And far enough to show that it could not see me. Or simply didn't care I was there. And now, all I have of you is this arm. The rest is underneath the sentry, or else is so ruined that I no longer recognize it as part of you. All I have is your arm. I don't even have your dream anymore. Or, I don't know. I suppose what I'm trying to do is apologize. But it seemed important to run through everything that's happened in my mind and then say it out loud. I know you hate long stories, but there's also not much else to do right now. I don't know if you were right, that you should have left me behind. Those mountains, that horizon, they're no closer than they were three nights ago. Maybe you could have made it alone. But for me, can there be escape? Do I believe it anymore? Do I believe I deserve it? I've thought about taking you back. Even if you can't be where you wanted to be, I'd hope you might find some solace in being buried where we first held hands. I'd bury you there, and then burn all of it. Because there is no escape. And there is no hope for the people of this valley. And there is no great penance that we're completing. This is simply who we are. Our ancient sin is still our sin. And there will be no forgiveness. So rather than doom future children to dreams, I'd end it. Expose all of us to the light of the sun so that we may be judged and finally let this place come to a silent, dusty peace. Or, maybe I keep trying for that horizon. Bury you there. 
I'll think about it. It's high noon now. Plenty of time until the sun goes down. This week's episode, In the Valley at High Noon, was written and performed by Anthony Botello. The Wrong Station is made possible with the generous support of our listeners on Patreon. Thank you to Ryan Johnson, and a very special thanks to Rishab Shukla for helping us keep the lights, well, off. You can also support us by leaving a rating and review on iTunes, or wherever it is you listen to The Wrong Station. The Wrong Station is co-produced by Alexander Saxton, Anthony Botello, and Jacob Duarte Spiel, with music composed and performed on the piano by Elan Citrin, and arranged for the viola and performed by Viola Schmidt. You can follow The Wrong Station on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and email us at therongstation at gmail.com. And until next time, thank you for listening.